Good morning, Three Creeks. Hi. Some of you are like, man, it was like one COVID season and you're back. And other of you are like, who is this guy? <laughs> My name's Trey and uh, I am the pastor at Contrast Church. Um, I thought to win some street cred here, I'd show you my cute family. So this is a photo of my family. Uh, I'm the one on the right. <laughs> my daughter in the middle is Junia, my wife, Sarah. And uh, we have another one on the way due in August, another girl. So I am officially living that girl dad dream. It's amazing. Uh, yes, uh, the next photo is Mark, Joel, and myself. This is at our launch day at Contrast Church. We are meeting on a space, a very tiny space, uh, on King Avenue and Grandview, and that's our target region is Grandview, Grandview Heights, that area. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a cool opportunity it's been to be a part of church planting. Um, I was very excited about it, and, and um, let me tell you, it's been a dream. It's been incredibly hard, but uh, so fulfilling. And so today, I, I get the opportunity just to talk with you all about church planting. And I, I honestly, I think the better overarching phrase is, um, is just discipleship and multiplication, that idea of reproducing things that are healthy. Church planting is one of those means. It's, I think it's one of the best, and I'm going to argue that uh, for a little bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, church planting is not just this little niche thing that some people do. It's something that all followers of Jesus should be a part of. And I want to kind of show you that today uh, as you maybe ask yourself, like, what does this mean for me to be a part of this? In fact, some of you maybe didn't even know that Three Creeks helped plant us. Some of you might not even know that they're still supporting us financially. Um, and so it, it's, it's a huge honor to get to be here with you guys. And so I want to start off with a question. Uh, I love, love crowd interaction here, okay? So I need you to raise your hands in this question, okay? Here's the question. Would you rather, for the next 31 days, for the next month, would you rather receive $10,000 a day, or would you rather receive a penny on the first day, but it doubles every day after? Raise your hand, $10,000. I'll take $10,000 a day. Anyone? Like, that's $300,000. Would you take that, anyone? Okay. Raise your hand if you would take the penny that would double, Okay. Raise your hand if you're just like, I don't like raising my hand. Raise your Okay. Okay. All right. Good. I see you. I see that hand. So I, I remember listening to this and um, I'm somebody who I'm a big instant gratification kind of guy. I'm like the $10,000. I mean, that's $300,000. That's pretty good, right? Uh, but those of you who are mathematicians here know that, 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 doesn't, that that's an interesting quandary. Now, what if I was to say, hey, let's, let's raise the stakes a little bit. What if the 10000 was $100,000 a day? So about $3 million at the end of it. You'd be like, hmm, I'm, I'm more enticed. I'm more enticed. And, and I want to show you the math here. This is what happens whenever you double a penny a day. For, thir for 30 days, 31 days, would be $10 million. As you can tell, it starts really small. It starts really small. But at the end of the day, the ones who took the small amount at the beginning that multiplied had far more than those who just took the addition for the month. And this is just a way to communicate, and I'm going to argue that multiplication is always better than simple addition. It might not look as good at the beginning, but at the end of the day, it will create far greater impact than just simple addition. So today, I just want, I want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about church planning. But like I said, I use this word discipleship, I use this word multiplication. And, and what I would use to define those specifically are just what does it mean to follow Jesus and to help others follow him? That's a call of a follower of Jesus is to follow him and to help others follow him. That's what uh, Three Creeks is to help people find and follow God, right? And, and in that, we all have a role to play in that specific mission. In fact, some of you have maybe grown up in the church. Some of you, maybe you're new to the church. If you've even been here a little bit, you've probably felt like church is this weird funnel where you have these opportunities, maybe on Sundays, maybe at big outreach events. You have all these people. You gather up all these people, and then you have this funnel. And what I mean by the funnel is you have people who come here on Christmas or Easter, people who come here for maybe something simple on a Sunday, or they just want to be able to say they went to church. But then you have these people who are more committed. They're more interested in the way of Jesus. And so they might serve. They might, uh, they might give. They might be in a group, right? And then you start to taper this group down into these like super spiritual juggernauts, right? <laughs> There's a few of them and they just are all in and they're super dedicated to Jesus. And it's this funnel, right? The people on the top are like shallow and they need to become more, more legitimate, right? And as you get farther down, you have these few people who are the core, who are the, just following Jesus deeply. And that's kind of how we think of church and that's kind of how we think of 
discipleship. How do we help other people follow Jesus? We start with a wide funnel, wide net, and we refine it as we go. But if we look at Jesus's ministry, it's actually the exact opposite. This diagram kind of helps you show that. You attend, you connect, you serve, you go. But at the end of the day, the funnel is so narrow that only a few people get to be in the game. Jesus did the exact opposite. He started with, with really three, his three closest disciples. They got some insider knowledge. The other 12 didn't. But he didn't, he didn't gather a crowd of 10,000, sit there at a table, take everybody's resumes, and just kind of weed them out like college applications, right? He took 12 teenage boys that were really nothing special, fishermen, I mean, most of them. Um, I'm, I love fishing, but doing it as a profession, it, you know, you're not, you're not going to be the most prominent person in your city. And he takes these guys and he lives life deeply with them deeply. And we see that they are just blathering around for the three years that he does ministry with them. I mean, my gosh, they ask the, the dumbest questions. They do dumb things. They, one of them betrays him, right? We maybe know a little bit of the story. And you, you kind of have to ask yourself, what in the world is Jesus doing? Why did he pick such three who even betrayed him, 12 who really betrayed him, right? Like, why is this his model? Why did he not gather this large crowd and filter out the very best people? And it's because the, the process of discipleship and the way of reaching people and the way of following Jesus is not this refining funnel. It is to use ordinary people with an extraordinary power of the Spirit. And in that way, we see in the book of Acts, these disciples just become just amazing. I mean, they're just phenomenal. And it's almost like this, this switch is just flipped. So church planning multiplication, I would argue, is, is, and you maybe heard this, is the most effective way to reach lost people for the gospel. Uh, it's funny because some people would say, and they say, yeah, you know, this has been the trend over the last few decades. And I'm like, actually, yeah, I don't know if you knew this, but every church was a church plant at some point. Think about that. Like the church that's 400 years old, someone had to plant that sometime. <laughs> every church is a church plant. The, the, the idea of multiplication has been around since Jesus' time. And so the first kind of uh, piece that I want to argue for church planning multiplication is that Jesus modeled it. He was, the, he was the first pioneer of this in the way that he, like I said, decided from 3 to 12, then to 72. He spoke, he, he, he multiplied through that. In fact, when he ascended into heaven after he was killed and resurrected, there was about 120 of them. That's, that's less than the people in this room. That is not a lot of people. And those 120 multiply the gospel so powerfully that you're sitting in this chair now and there's thousands and millions of churches in the world right now gathering because of those 120 people. Jesus is modeling an idea of multiplication that is not just simply addition. It's not just simply plateauing or planing. It is this idea that disciples make disciples who make disciples. And, and Jesus models this idea of sending. One of the things that's the hardest about multiplication is that you're, you're having to go. You, can't, you don't just sit on your couch and multiply. That's true with really anything. If you want to start a business, you want to franchise something, you don't just sit on your couch. You have to go to all these locations and find the right cities and, and do all this research, and you, you spread your net out, right? And, 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 and implicit in multiplication is going. And Jesus says, he says, look, the Father has sent me. I am sending you. There's sending, not I have sent, I will send. Sending It is a continual process that we're all a part of. So Jesus did this. It was a command, but it wasn't just Jesus. It was the early church and the last 2,000 years. This has been the DNA of the church. If you want to turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts, our church is going through this. Mark is actually teaching on this part of this passage today. The book of Acts is the, the sequel to uh, the book of Luke. And uh, Luke is just letting you know just how powerful this Holy Spirit is and what it's doing in the disciples' lives. And really, the book of Acts is an entire book of multiplication. It's church planting. It's disciple making. It's spirit-led steps. Everybody who maybe who reads the book of Acts is like, man, I just... I just wish we could live like the book of Acts, you know? It's just this crazy, great story that I want to be a part of, right? And, and we read it. But in Acts 2, what, what occurs here is, like I said, the disciples had been really just not super great friends to Jesus during his last few days on earth. He resurrects. They're still kind of unsure. You know, I got to stick my finger in these wounds, make sure you're real and not a ghost. Eat some fish. That way, then I'll really know. Eat this piece of fish, right? And he does that. 
And he teaches them about the kingdom for about 40 days, and then he ascends to the heavens, and he leaves them, right? He leaves them on their own to wait for the Spirit. And I will tell you that if I had to pick a point at which the this, this switch was flipped for them, for these disciples, it was when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter, who had just failed so many times before this, he was a big, he was a lot of words, right? He was a big words guy. He'd say a lot of things, but it wouldn't back him up. Who had just abandoned Jesus and been restored. In, in verse 14 through 35 in chapter 2, I'm not going to read it all, but what he's doing there, if you look in your Bibles, you've got some black words there. They're maybe italicized, right? Like they're, they're bolder than the other ones. He's giving like the first sermon of all time, and it's legendary. It's amazing. And you're like, Peter, where is this coming from? You, you, you were not this way before. And, and Jesus uses ordinary men to share the gospel in this case in an extraordinary way. And, and what I want you to know is the beauty of this moment, if you read in verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He calls them out, right? He's like kind of sticking it to them. And then this is what happens in verse 37. When they had heard this, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. And here we go, verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized and that day, 3,000 people were added. 3,000. That's pretty, it's pretty good, right? It's a pretty good sermon. Peter, nice job, man. The, the, the start of the book of Acts and the end of the book of Acts is all about multiplication. Start off with 120 disciples. Peter gets a few thousand there. Those, those few thousand start to tell their families and their friends and their circles. At the end of the book of Acts, they estimate there's around 50,000 followers of Jesus. What's even crazier is by 400 AD, so a couple hundred years later, the Roman Empire legalized Christianity, there's about 34 million Christians, half of the Roman Empire. Now, over 400 years, you go from 120 to several million people. The gospel has been a, a multiplication mindset since the very beginning. If you read in the book of Acts, people are going and planting churches. They're starting house churches. They're, they're discipling their neighbors, their friends, their coworkers, their family. It is a part of the process. You don't, you don't hide a bushel, right? You don't hide a light under a bushel, right? You show it and you reveal it to the world, that you are ascending uh, people. And you might, you might read this, and sometimes people do this. They say, Trey, the book of Acts is great, but like, you know, they're, they're professional missionaries, right? They're like, this is what they do. They dedicate their life. They love their families, their jobs. They, they don't have anything. Like, they, they just, they're way too radical. They're professionals. And like I said earlier, they are far from professionals. In fact, they, they may have left everything, but they, they are by far not professionals. They could barely fish, <laughs> And, and, and furthermore, if you look for the word missionary, right, you know some people are missionaries. If you look for the word missionary in the Bible, you will have a very hard time finding it. It's because the term missionary is not in there because it is, not, it is assumed that everybody is, is living missionally in their lives. There is, there is no professional missionary. Now, I know we support missionaries overseas. We support missionaries in our area and in inner cities and things like that, right? But at the end of the day, we are all missionaries. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, pretty boldly, he said, I, I, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. It's kind of mean, but, he, but is he wrong? Is he wrong? If, if you believe in, in life, if you believe that Jesus is life, that he changes the game for everyone around you, and you're not willing to share it, are you really understanding the weight of it? Jesus did, the apostles did. And this has happened for the last two millennium that the gospel has advanced through multiplication. I actually went to um, Judson University for my undergrad in Chicago, if you've been uh, in Chicago. And uh, it was named after Adoniram Judson, which maybe you have heard of, maybe you haven't. He was considered America's first missionary, like full-time professional missionary, I guess you could say, right? Even though we just said there are no missionaries. But he went over to Burma 
And uh, in Burma, he toiled for, I believe it was seven years, seven years, without a single person coming to faith. Can you imagine seven years of your life? Like, and you're like, this is full time. Like, this is your thing, right? If you like quit your day job right now and you're like, I'm going to go make disciples. In seven years, you got nothing. We would start to ask some questions. We're like, is this person just like weird? Or, I mean, what's going on here? You know, and, and he's, he's a professional, right? Like he's, he's dedicating his life to this. Seven years, not one single person follows Jesus. And he doesn't give up. I would, have, I would have given up. I don't know. Seven years. I don't know about you. Seven years is a long time to see zero fruit, right? You don't, you don't see that like, you, just, you don't think that seven years will be worth it. Okay, but then listen, six more years starts to gain some traction. Six more years go by, 13 years. So he has enough to finally start a very small church. I don't know, 20 to 50 people, right? 13 years. He's given away a fifth, maybe a seventh of his life right? Doing this. And he's got a small group of people to show for it. And you think, man, okay, he's got some people. I guess he's not like a complete failure. He leaves Burma. And by the, he, a few years later, by the time he leaves Burma, there's 7,000 people following Jesus. By the time he dies, they estimated there was 21,000. Started with just one, went to 20 to 50, grew to 7,000, 21,000. Who knows how many? I don't, I don't even know what the records are now. He died a while ago. But it's thinking about if I spent 13 years of my life for just a few people, is it actually worth it? Most of us would be like, I don't know. But the impact of multiplication, if we truly are loving, discipling people well, the multiplication impact is far greater than anything we can ever do. And Adonai Judson is a legend for this because he was so faithful. And I, I think this is such an indicative um, parallel to our lives as followers of Jesus that we are sowing seeds that we might never see the fruit of in our lifetime. We are, we are, we are toiling and we are working and we are, we are building relationships. We are being generous to people. We are, we are trying to love our neighbor well and there are seeds that we will never see come to fruition. And maybe they will. And maybe you'll get to see them, but I would argue typically you don't. You don't know that what conversation you have, what relationship you had that furthered a deeper heart gospel moment for that person. And, and you might not know when it'll happen, but it can. They say that most people, and I don't know how true this statistic is, but most people who decide to follow Jesus late in their life had several, if not dozens of people that were Christians that were speaking truth in their life through that journey, which means that it's very rare that the first Christian in their life, that they start to see it and believe it and, and go for it. And so are you okay being number two and never knowing? Are you okay being number four and never knowing? Are you okay being the friend who's number seven that's been with them for a decade, not seeing any progress, but at the end of the day, they come to follow Jesus? What you are doing now matters for eternity. What we are doing with church planting matters for eternity. I will die, and Mark will die, and Joel will die eventually, and Lord willing, churches will stay around more churches reaching more people in unique ways in areas that we can never reach. And, and when we have an eternal perspective like that, it is just so encouraging. When I first met Mark, Mark is young like all of us, and he, uh, like me and Joel, and, and I met him, and I was like, I've never met someone just that's so futuristic. He just thinks so far ahead. And he had this, this just dream, I'll say dream, that, that he wanted to see 25 Church is planned in 25 years, 50 in 50 years. And you think about that, you're like, that's just crazy, man. What do you, I mean, come on, 50 churches? Do we even need 50 churches in Columbus? I don't know. 50 churches? Do you know how much work that's going to take? And, and we're, we're two in, right? We got three. Look at us go, right? But it, it actually gets easier. Why does it get easier? Well, because of multiplication. We have all signed up for the exact same thing that Mark signed up for. We all save 5% of all of our giving to give to church planting. We all are bringing on residents. We're all looking at regions to plant in the next few years. And, and at the end of the day, in five years, if we have five churches, it will not take very long to get 25 because all of us only have to plant one, more, like one church that plants again. Now, if, if Mark said, our church is going to plant 50 churches, it would be pretty wild of a dream. But I, I encourage you, think ahead don't just, don't just think in the moment of what, because when you can think ahead and you can go back to where you are now, it makes far more sense. How am I leveraging and living in my life to see multiplication come to fruition and know that I might be planting seeds that I will never get to see the fruit of? And, and that's the truth is some of you didn't even have, are near new to Three Creeks. You haven't gotten to see the fruit of, of Contrast Church. 
We've already baptized several people. We had uh, four kids come to Jesus during the Holy Week, the week before Easter. We had this app, and they were reading it with their parents. We had four kids at our church come to Jesus. We've baptized several. We've had lots of people who had church, serious church hurts, find freedom in church and in Christ in a group of people that love them. We've had people read their Bibles more than they've read them their entire life in the last two years. And it's all because of what you guys have done. It's because of the hardships and the difficulties of what you have done. We have created a space in Grandview that we just want to bless and give away to people in Grandview. We're building favor in a community that is a very, very hard place for those who follow Jesus. These are the type of things that we do in the out front knowing we might not ever see the fruit. You're getting to see some of the fruit today, and that's the beauty of it. But just imagine the fruit in two decades, in four decades, when you're maybe not even in Columbus. And so this, this goes to the, to the third point. It's the strategy now, too. It was the strategy of Jesus. It was the strategy in the early church for the last 2,000 years. It, was a stra- it is a strategy now. And, it, and more churches and denominations are understanding this is the best way to reach people. Paul says this. I, I love this. He says in, uh, in the, writing to the church of Rome, he says, I am under obligation, some translations would say, or a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Now, what he's saying here is, I have an obligation to live missionally, to share my faith, to multiply the gospel. I think about a debtor. Anybody here still living that college loan life? You still paying that off? Anybody here? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? I was smart enough to get into college, dumb enough to go to an out-of-state tuition private school. So, uh, still paying that one off. Uh, but every month, right, I get paid, and what do I do? We set aside how much we're going to give away every month. We set aside our mortgage. It's important. And then we pay off our debts. It's our third priority, essentially, right? And we are enslaved to that debt until it is gone. Now, enslaved, typically in this regard, is kind of a negative thing, right? I don't have freedom. I am, I am enslaved. But Paul uses this idea in such a way that it's freeing. And in fact, he says, I am free, therefore I become a slave. You're like, that doesn't make any sense, Paul. You don't run away and then go back to slavery. That's not how that works. But Paul is on to something deeper here. If, we are, if Jesus has bought the price for us, if he has given us life, we become a slave to him out of love. And he says, I am indebted to people. Do you feel that? Do you feel that burden? When you walk through your neighborhood, do you just feel like, Lord, like you've placed us here in a beautiful way. Praise God that we're here. Can I just, can I just give my life over to these people? My time, my money, my, my generosity, my house. Can I just give it over? I am greatly indebted to you because you have paid off my debt. And out of my freedom, I'm willingly stepping into slavery. What did Jesus do? Out of his freedom, he willingly slept in. He stepped into slavery, to, to abuse and to uh, massive misunderstandings and, and malicious words spoke against him. We, we, are, we are no different today that we are indebted to be a people that shares the gospel through multiplication. We, uh, we got these t-shirts had uh, a contrast. We're a young church, transient. Grandview's a transient area. Most people don't live there for probably more than five years unless you somehow, gave, someone gave you a house or you, you make a lot of money. And so a lot of young people love living there. We have a great, great date night spot. If you're looking for a date night, Grandview's the place. And people don't live there very long. So what do we do? I own a truck. I move people all the time, all the time, all the time. We were, we were, it was such a joke at our church that we're like, you know what, let's get some t-shirts. Might as well, right? Make it more fun. We got these t-shirts that say Contrast Church Moving Crew. On the back it says, Faith That Moves Mountains, Helpers That Move Boxes. How lame is that? I mean, we're going to reach people with those. And we, we were moving this one guy and uh, his, his friend who wasn't a Christian came. Like 10 of us are wearing these shirts. And, and we're just standing there waiting to get ready. And he's like, so are you guys like a real moving crew? Like, do you get paid? <laughs> but we, like, how can we be present in the area we are? And, and, and it's like just, just indebted to people in their lives, to times of transition, to times of hardship. I loved up here, there's three families that are just experiencing rough things. And, and, and you if you are calling yourselves a part of Three Creeks Church, if you're new, I'm letting you off the hook. I'm also a guest speaker, so you won't see me next week. But if you call yourselves Three Creeks Church, you are indebted to serving those people. That is the way of Jesus. 
And, and in the same way, we're indebted to move people. We are to become slaves so that some might be one, to be multiplied. We are to plant seeds that we might never see the reality of. And so I want to I transition and close with, with this. Um, there are three reasons why multiplication is incredibly hard and why most churches talk about it but never do it. The first one is that it's slow. Like I said, it is very slow. We um, are just starting to see growth of people that we actually are trying to reach. You know what I mean? It's like you plant a church, be like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to go to that. And you get people that are, you know, at different areas. We're like, we want to reach these people in this area at this time. We're starting to actually finally see those people show up or be in conversations and relationships. And we've been there. I mean, I know COVID, but we've been there for like two years, right? And I have this one neighbor, and I have been praying for him in my core group every week that he might come to know Jesus, that he might take serious steps. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I've done everything I can to be around that, that guy's house. And, and just over the last several weeks, we started a thing called DBS. It's called Discovery Bible Study. It's online. Anybody can lead this thing. It is so simple. It's like five questions. You read, you read through it. You can cover any passages in the Bible. It takes no professional skills. And I said, hey, man, you just want to start meeting weekly. I've been praying for him. We've been meeting. I've been hanging out with him. I said, hey, you want to start meeting and doing this? And, and just weeks and weeks and weeks, right? I, I, we do this. We read the Bible. We talk about the gospel. I invite him to church every Sunday. Every, I mean, just, I've had people hang out with him to invite him. Never showed up, never showed up. Excuse, 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 right? I mean, talking for months. Our launch, big events, right? All this stuff, you, um, free pizza, whatever you can do, right? We're going to give you a million dollars. No, it doesn't show up. And, and I'm just, I'm, I'm sitting in this, this toiling with my core group, just praying for him weekly, not giving up. And just over the last few weeks, I started to notice a shift. I used to text him every Sunday and say, hey, man, when are we meeting up this week? When are we meeting up this week? And then all of a sudden, now he's texting me. He says, hey, when are we meeting up this week? What are we, what are we reading about? And just this last week, he said, hey, I've got a friend who's not a Christian at all. He's in the same place I am. I want, he wants to be a part of this. Now, I'm telling you, I, got, I mean, there's very little wins right now. But, I mean, this is, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. He could move tomorrow and I, I planted seeds that I might never see the fruit of. And, and I have leveraged time in my life and relationship. I have given away tools. I have mailed letters. for I, I, just, just normal human things with the understanding that what I am doing in his life, God could multiply in ways that I could never fathom. And, and, and I'm not, I mean, I know, oh, I'm a pastor. I'm like paid to do this and whatever. I have degrees. What, I, just can we stop with that? Like, I'm a, I'm a neighbor who went up. I'm so awkward. You know, I'm like, hey, what do you think about spoons? You think those are pretty cool, you know? <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, I look cool up here. I'm, a, I'm socially awkward. I just, you got to do it, and you got to learn. I'm introverted. Okay, well, it's one person. You like one group people. <laughs> You're extroverted. Have a party. I don't know, whatever. Like, just come on, guys. Like, look, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It is hard. My wife has heard me say it's hard all the time, but what we're doing has eternal value. Nothing else matters. Other than, the only thing you can take with you is people. God takes them, but it, you're going to be a part of that. And it's hard. Second thing is it's uncomfortable. I remember when we, I was a resident, and I was, and I, it was really weird. It was like I felt like I was dating two churches. I'd go to movement in the morning and three creeks in the afternoon, and uh, it felt real spiritual. And I would, you know, I'd try to like, you know, we're trying to gather a launch team, try to like win people over. Like I said, a little socially awkward. And I was like, you know, trying to make friends with people. And I have a year, I got a timeline. We want to make this thing happen. And, and I remember like one of the hardest conversations and I started to realize this was when people decided to go with us, they were cleaving, they were cleaving relationships that they had. There's some of you that were friends with people who are at our church right now that you probably haven't talked to in a few months that you used to see every week. There are, there are homes that, you, that, that, that people at Contrast have left to move closer to our area. There are things that you've done that you've had to sever in order to bring life and multiplication. It is extremely uncomfortable. In a year or two, I don't know what your guys' timeline is, you will plant a church, and some of you will go with that church, and some of you will have to say, hey, I love you. I'll see you in heaven. I probably won't hang out with you as much anymore because I have a new mission. And praise God. That's why churches don't do this because they want to stay comfortable, but in the uncomfortability is the most beautiful thing you'll experience. And it's, it's this yearning for seeing the kingdom come and become a reality in people's lives. There's nothing that I get more excited for in my entire week with counseling people, with teaching on a Sunday, with, than, than hanging out with my neighbor one hour a week. I get more excited about that than anything else I'm doing. And any of you are able to do that. 
It's uncomfortable, and we have to acknowledge that. In fact, I've told people, you have to mourn what is different. Like, it, it, if you move, if you, if you, you relationships are different. And, and at the end of the day, we do this in groups. You guys multiply groups. You send people off to start a new group, and you're like, we loved our group. We were so close. And I'm like, imagine if Paul had said that. But I love Timothy and Silas. I don't want to go anywhere else. We would have like two letters instead of a, over a dozen in the New Testament. And he says, like, gospel goodbyes are hard. Like, in most of his letters, he's like, I miss you guys so much. I would love more than anything to be there. But what I'm doing, I'm indebted to. I need to do this. Some of you need to take a, a leap of faith, and you need to start thinking about multiplication in your own life. Some of you are in a group that is phenomenal, and you need to take that health, and you need to multiply it so that you can be healthy to more unhealthy people in your lives. I, I just, I know it's, it's, it's foolish to not acknowledge that it's, that it's uncomfortable. Another reason why it is not done, and I had no better way than to say this, it's not sexy. You can laugh. I mean, I, I think we have a pretty cool building. People love it. Cool. It's four walls. It could burn down tomorrow. It's, we are not baptizing 100 people on Easter. We don't even have 100 people in the building. We are in an area that is very hard, that does not have favor for churches. People are not like, oh, praise God, a church is here. Right? Like, we are fighting... New, uh, just so hard to even just build favor in our community. And, uh, there's people who have led in capacities that they've never led before. They have no idea what they're doing. I mean, it's the Peter moment where they get thrown in and they're like, I guess I'm just going to trust the Spirit. We have people who are directors that have never led anything. It's also not sexy because it's not an instantly gratifying thing. Like most church plants, I'm like, you might not even have a drummer for a few years. And God has been gracious to us. We have several, which is just wild. But like, you, you are dealing with worship that might not be as good. You're dealing with the teacher that might not be as good. You're dealing with a smaller building. You can't even like leave our building. It's so tiny. You just like, there's too many people. It's probably a fire hazard. I don't even know if what we're doing is legal. It's, it's literally not sexy. And I say that because it's not about that. There's so many people right now that are on this vein of like, it needs to be, if it's not sexy, if it's not excellent, if it's not beautiful, then it's not winning things over. And I'm telling you, multiplication is rarely ever, ever attractive at the beginning. It is hard and it is uncomfortable. But it's what is the gospel. It's what Jesus emulated. It's what the early church has emulated. And so I just want, I want to close with this. I'll invite up uh, the band. Is we don't just not do it because it's hard. Some of the hardest things in our lives have been some of the most formative things. In John 12, Jesus says, seeds must die in order to give life. There must be something that dies in order to give life. You ever thought about that when you sit around a dinner table and you're eating your steak? You ever think about how that, that something had to die for you to live? Now, if you're vegetarian, those vegetables still had to be chopped up, you know? They had to die in order for you to live. That is how life works. Something must die in order for life to come. And we are planting churches knowing that there are things that might have to come to an end, but at the end of the day, we're trusting that those seeds will germinate, that they will grow, and they will come and become an orchard instead of one tree. And so I just want to close with, what can I do about this? You read up in the portion, uh, 1 Corinthians 9. I love this passage. Paul is just saying, hey, just become all things to all people so that you can win all people. And, and at the end of the day, what that means is, when you can do that, you're not insecure because you're, you're like, it doesn't, these things don't matter. I will go and do this thing and look foolish because I don't care how I look. I care what's, what gospel is being preached. I will go to my neighbor and talk to them if I'm socially awkward or I'll invite them over for tacos because that's all we know how to cook, right? Because I, I will become all things to all people so that all people might know Christ. And I just encourage you in each of your lives, that is something unique. One book put it simply. It's like, hey, what are you good at? If you're good at something, just do that with kingdom purpose. Maybe it's your job. Maybe you can share your faith in your job. It's great, right? Maybe you're just a neighbor who owns a grill. Maybe you're a dad. I've found that, like, people just want to hang out. Like, I'm, I'm less weird and creepy when I have a daughter at a park, right? Because if I just go to a park normally, it's a little weird, right? Um, so I'm not advising that, maybe, if you don't have kids. But you got kids, and then all of a sudden, like, hey, tell me about your, your child, right? Like, what, are you guys new here? What do you, how, how's the area? How's, you know, it's just whatever you're good at, whatever God has placed you in, you don't have to quit your job and go preach on the corner. You just have to think about how can I be intentional about what God has given me? And, and so as I, as I close, I just, this verse right here, I just want this to resonate 
on your minds. He says in verse 23, I do all these things because of the gospel so that I can become a participant in it. Three Creeks Church, you guys have been a phenomenal participant in what we're doing, and we are so thankful and grateful. You sent people that um, are just great and that probably hurt your church because they left. You sent money, and you are, you are not able to do financial things that you could have done because of us. You have, you have willingly sacrificed so that my, things might come to life, and people are being reached in Grandview that you would never reach, and people are being reached here that we would never reach, and people are being reached in Hilliard that would never be reached, be, and the movement church is there. And I just want to say thank you, and I want to encourage you that in a year or two, when the time comes, be praying about this. How can I help financially? Can I be on the launch team? Can I, can I pray for church plans? I would love prayer. I would love prayer for my marriage. I would love prayer for our team. We are free in Christ. And because of that, we become slaves to the gospel. And because of that, multiplying in church planning is the best way to reach people. Multiplication will win every time. So I want to I close in prayer. But before I do, I just want you to know there are people in the back who would love to pray for you, love to stir for you. If this is your first Sunday at church in a very long time, it's probably pretty unique. Um, but I just want you to know that you're free. Even if you don't believe it, you're free in Christ. And so I just encourage you to, uh, people would love to pray for you. So I'm going to close in prayer, and we're going to close in one more song. Lord, thank you for your gospel. Thank you that you created a plan that we can follow that's beautiful. I thank you that, um, Lord, it's not about us and the growth. It's just about being faithful in the moments we're in. It's about planting seeds that we might never see the fruit of. Lord, we just pray that we would see beyond the instant, the moment. Lord, that you give us a vision for the future and give us a heart and a burden for the people that are right around us. Allow us to just leverage all things we have for the sake of the gospel, Lord, so that we might become participants in it for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.